So good afternoon. Thank you for being with us today. I'm happy to see all of you here for this talk, which is part of the CIS Get to Know Your Neighbors seminar series. As you know, with the seminars, we uh, strive to provide a platform for cross-school exchange for our EPFL community. Last month, we had the pleasure of hosting Professor Jörg Schiffmann from the Laboratory of Applied Mechanical Design. And today we are delighted to have Professor John Maddox, the head of the Laboratory for Computation, Visualization, and Mathematics and Mechanics with us. His talk is entitled DNA and Big Data. Give you an idea of what to, ex to expect. The seminar will last for approximately one hour, with John presenting for roughly 45 minutes, and then we have time for Q&A. So please, if you have any questions for John during his talk, just put them in the chat, and we'll take them up during the Q&A session. We also have the opportunity to unmute yourself and ask the questions directly to John. Before we dive into the presentation, I would like to thank John, of course, for his availability and the entire CS team for organizing this event. And now, John, the screen is all yours. Okay, thank you. So as always, thank you very much to the organizers for organizing this. Thank you to the audience for showing up. Uh, I guess we can't tell from the weather, but it really is the beginning of summer, right? We must, most of us must be done with exams. Anyway, okay, so um, I am not immune to using buzzwords. So DNA sort of by definition is sexy uh, and big data is a bit of a buzzword at the moment, but there we go. So this is the title and that's uh, who paid for it. Uh, and there we go. Ah, now, ah, you test the key buttons when you're not in full screen mode. Okay, there we go. It's so, yeah, it's now okay. I just have to use the mouse to change screens, but that's fine. So I wanted to start off with a little bit of uh, philosophy. So in fact, I was an undergraduate at the University of Glasgow, and I studied jointly physics and mathematics, uh, at least for two years. And the point was, I didn't study physics, I studied natural philosophy. And natural philosophy, because Kelvin uh, was the professor of natural philosophy uh, at Glasgow. And in some sense, DNA, uh, and I'm going to actually make the link to bioinformatics, which is very much a 21st century subject, but I want to do the physics of DNA, but it's actually, it's not even the 20th century, it's the 19th century physics of DNA, it's statistical mechanics, and so that's why I'm going to say it's the, the, the natural philosophy. Okay, so certainly, um, you know, the major one of the major accomplishments already in the twenty uh, first century are the sequencing of human and other organisms, the entire uh, genome in the ATCG standard uh, sequence or base alphabet, and that was very very uh, big, uh, uh, close to the beginning of the century. Now, in the initially, that was an averaged. Um, oh, yeah, that was a, an averaged. Uh, genome. And now, basically, you know, it's close to trivial, you can get your own genome sequence, right? So now you have individual genomes, personalized medicine, whatever it's still going on. Uh, now, increasingly, people are, are realizing that epigenetics is very important. And that means that it's not actually just the ATCG alphabet, you can get modified bases, uh, which are to do with epigenetics. Uh, those bases can be differently modified in different organs in the body um, and uh, so you get tissue specific so those are called epigenomes and that's certainly an ongoing subject and I'll come back I'll talk a, a little bit later on about methylating C's which is perhaps the the best known epigenetic base modification but in fact that more and more they're finding there's even more ones like that and the point is, this really is the realm of bioinformatics. So bioinformatics is it's lists of billions of letters. It's just a string in a certain alphabet. Uh, then the biologists come in when you annotate uh, these sequences. That's annotated bioinformatics. So they know very, to a great deal of extent, which subsequences, which regions are responsible for what and when. And if you have a, a, a mutation or a different version of a gene, I mean, they know uh, uh, when you make changes in this list, uh, uh, what kind of effects it has. There's an amazing amount of information that's known, uh, things like that. But the thing is that perhaps isn't so well known is how do changes in the sequence affect changes in function? 
And that's when, I, in fact, maybe the, the topical conversation is, of course, COVID. And so there's, we're not allowed to call it the Indian variant anymore or whatever. We have to call it the Lambda and the Delta and the whatever variants like that. So, I mean, COVID, it's only 30,000 base pairs or so. It's quite short. It's a single-stranded RNA, but all these variants, they're just studying the list of letters, right? Now, they know which letters are good or bad, variants of concern, I'm British, fortunately I haven't been in Britain, but I mean, Britain's bad at the moment for things like that. But the, I mean, this is really the question is, the question I want to talk about, I'm interested in, uh, I mean, you really need to understand the physics. You need to understand the 19th century physics, the statistical mechanics of uh, the DNA to understand of, if you make changes in the genome, how does it make different changes? And that's exactly what I'm interested in, in talking about. I want to talk a little bit about that today. Now, one thing is that, uh, I mean, COVID, as it happens, it's an RNA virus. You do get DNA viruses, but the more common are RNA. COVID is also a single-stranded RNA virus. And that's precisely, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about DNA, and I'm going to talk about double-stranded DNA. And not that single-stranded is a very different beast. It's very floppy, it, uh, nothing to do. But most of your DNA, most of the time, in your body is in a double-stranded form, and it's a relatively rigid thing, and th those are the things where, uh, I mean, I really want to look at. Okay, so that's a little bit of the motivation of the DNA, and so I wanted to then say that I wanted to talk about big data, and I want to talk about two, ver I mean, two contexts of big data. So one thing is I want to sort of do pattern and feature recognition in ensembles, uh, and it's an ensemble of millions, or if I push things, billions of members of multivariate banded Gaussian PDFs. And when I say banded, it's banded in the uh, inverse covariance matrix. So I tend to call that a stiffness matrix. That's it's usually some kind of rigidity in a, in a statistical mechanics model. Some people would call it a precision matrix or the inverse covariance matrix. But that's the matrix that we're going to assume is banded. And it's going to, I'll hope to convince you, show you that it's banded because DNA is long and thin. So the base pair at location five is unlikely to be phys have physical interactions with the base pair at location uh, 100,000. And that's really nice. Then each of these Gaussians is in dimension N. And the sort of order I'm looking at are going to be a few hundred to a few thousand. But the, the nice thing is the uh, uh, bandwidth is always going to be 42. So for fans of uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you now know what the question was. Right. So um, where do these ensembles come from? So the whole point is they're generated from a tool that we call CGDNA lock, where lock is for local, right? And CGDNA lock is a tool uh, that you can specify a short window in the genome. Uh, and that short window could be say a, a few tens, I mean, it could be a single, it could be 10 to say a thousand, more likely uh, 10 or 20 to 200 base pairs. And you're trying to identify regions in the genome with exceptional statistical mechanical properties, right? And they could be that there's a certain region of the double-stranded DNA that's particularly bent in an intrinsic sense. It could be particularly straight. It could be particularly stiff. It could be particularly soft. And somehow what we're trying to do is we want to try and, try and understand a link between exceptional statistical mechanical properties and with what's known with the annotated bioinformatics. So we want to inject mechanics into the bioinformatics. That's sort of the, the, the goal. Now, CGDNA lock, it's actually in a, a, you know, a strictly mathematical sense. It's a marginal PDF of a coarse grain equilibrium statistical mechanics model of DS DNA. DS is double-stranded DNA, which we call CGDNA plus. So the second place I want to talk about big data is that we somehow need to construct this CGDNA plus model. And the sequence dependent CGDNA plus, actually it's a family of coarse grain models. They actually have a machine learning flavor 
in that inside these models, there's uh, around 20,000 parameters that you need to fit. Now, there's a famous example that uh, John von Neumann, Neumann. said, uh, so now I heard of, uh, is that a question? No? Okay. So there's a famous que uh, remark from John von Neumann that if you gave him six parameters, he could model an elephant. And if you gave him eight, he could make the elephant wiggle its tongue, right? So eight to 20,000 is quite a difference. But somehow uh, the point is that this model has to be able to predict four to the n sequences with n of the order of a few tens of, of base pairs, at least, maybe hundreds. And so the four to the n comes because this in the standard alphabet, it's ATCG. I mean, it'd be higher than four if you allowed methylated bases. Uh, and then you have four choices for every slot. And then for those of you who are familiar with that, if you do that computation, n equals 10, that's more or less 500,000 independent sequences. So then 20,000 parameters and 500,000 sequences seems a bit more reasonable. And in, in particular, you then multiply by another million to go out to 20 or more base pairs. So you have to hit an awful number, a lot of cases. So it's not so ridiculous to have so many parameters to fit like that. Uh, I should say, by the way, uh, I'm not going to emphasize it too much here. It's not actually four to the n. It's more or less four to the n, but you have double strands. So if you know the sequence on one strand, say the Watson strand, then that forces the sequence on the other strand, the Crick strand. So in, in some sense, you divide by two. It's not quite that count because you get something called palindromes and things like that. So but let me not go into that. But ballpark, it's four to the n. Sometimes it's four to the n divided by two. So, uh, all right. So the, the, the thing about the CGDNA plus model is its parameter set depends just upon the local dinucleotide step, right? So it, I mean, you could have an A followed by a G, an A followed by a T along one backbone. And that's how that's the parameter dependence of the set. But then with that parameter set, uh, that should allow you to predict an equilibrium distribution in the form of a banded Gaussian uh, for any sequence. But it's still an awful lot of numbers. So how do we get these 20,000 numbers? So the point is those parameter sets they're estimated from a small, uh, currently we actually do this with a 16 member training library of rather long duration molecular dynamics simulations. And by long duration for a molecular dynamics simulation, I mean 10 microseconds. It's kind of a bit strange to say 10 microseconds is long, but for molecular dynamics simulations, it is. The time stepping algorithm in a molecular dynamics simulation is typically femtoseconds, 10 to the minus 15. You usually uh, sample it at picoseconds, uh, 10 to the minus 12. So, um, uh, the, so, um, you'd actually have these 10 to the 10 time steps and you'd save 10 to the seven snapshots. Uh, the thing about these MD simulations is you have, I mean, molecular dynamic simulations in principle are deterministic, but DNA biology is stochastic. And of course the difference is it's what, how much you trace the solvent. And the point is that in these MD simulations, um, many people, most people, I think, say you have to do fully atomistic solvent. And that means that your molecular dynamic simulation, you're running that in dimension 50,000. You have 50,000 ordinary differential equations, right? They correspond to a short fragment, 24 base pair fragment of DNA. And so that means one library corresponding to one MD simulation is about 1.6 times 10 to the eight snapshots in dimension, and the dimensions, interestingly enough, are 558 or 50,000. And the difference is whether you keep the water. And the whole point is that for the coarse graining the DNA, you don't actually care either about the waters or the ions, and each snapshot is of this size. Now, I guess it's a bit subjective whether you call that uh, big data or not. Um, I guess I do sort of by definition. But the interesting thing is that all of your simulation 
in your fine grain model, most of your effort is modeling water and ions, which you then promptly throw away. And the only thing you keep is this 558 dimensions. On the other hand, you have 1.6 times 10 to the eight snapshots. So I'm still gonna call that big. Okay, so, uh, so we have big data once we start using the coarse grain model, and we have big data to train the coarse grain model. And that's what I, I'm gonna say a little bit about each of them. Right? So I'll concentrate on the big data when we use the model, in fact. Okay, but then let me make it a little bit more precise uh, what it is uh, we want to train. So we want a predictive coarse grain model now, the crucial thing is it has to depend upon the sequence. I mean, if you throw away the sequence in DNA, you've thrown away the biology, right? So you can't say that it's uniform coefficients, da, da. I mean, you need to have a different equilibrium distribution for every possible sequence, right? right? And so that is going to then um, involve a ground state structure, which is some kind of a, you know, the most likely state, or a minimum free energy state, but then it also, so that would be my red shape like this, and then it's flexibility. So visualization, is those little lines, it's wiggling, right? It's wiggling. And the point then is that this DNA, the red blob, is in the solvent bath, and it's very important. Actually, the water maybe isn't so crucial, but DNA is dioxynucleic acid. And so the point is acids are negatively charged. So they interact a lot with counter ions. And for example, the properties of DNA matter a lot on the concentration of the ions in the, in the solvent and the species of the ion in the solvent like that. So you really do need to simulate these, but then you get a bunch of snapshots. And so then somehow the idea is that you have this probability density function, and this is a, you know, so then you have a peak if it's a Gaussian, da, 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 da. And down here, of course, I draw it in R2, but that's really in Rn, and for a 24 base pair, molecule n is 558 it's going to turn out so it's a very it's, it's a quite high dimensional multivariate model okay so then here's now some slides um i mean a lot of people have been working on this for a lot of years so i want to recognize their names um, in point of fact there's a dedicated web page to all publications that came from uh uh, uh for cgdna i'm going to talk about cgdna plus I'll explain what the plus means in a little bit. The original CGDNA model uh, was done by these guys. Uh, the plus is a PhD thesis of Patelli. There's a current student, Raul Sharma. Actually, the plus is adding in phosphates like that. Um, and in fact, most of my applications I'm going to talk about are CGDNA lock, and that's a PhD uh, pro, an ongoing, nearly finished PhD thesis of uh, Thomas Valen. For those of you who like playing around, if you actually want to try this model, um, you can actually run a web interface. Uh, it's interesting, biologists, well, for example, I like MATLAB, but that's because I sit in a math department. So, I mean, if you really want to make an impact in some kind of modeling, it better be based on the web. So there's a web interface of uh, CGDNA. Actually, this is with the guy, Leonard De Bruyne. Uh, that issue is there, that's now, in fact, that originally it was a CGDNA web server. It's now, in fact, a CGDNA plus web server. Or you can run it in MATLAB or you can run it in Python. Okay, so now I've done my obligatory crediting the people who actually did the work. And then we'll maybe go on and explain a little bit what's going on, right? So what do I mean by coarse grain? Well, so it's a coarse grain model. Each base and each phosphate group is explicitly described as a distinct rigid body. So there's a whole bunch of business. They're actually made up of atoms, but the groups of the atoms are relatively rigid. And there's ways of fitting, best fitting a rigid body to a group of atoms. So that's some of the idea. This is the thing. So you get all these stacks like that. Bah, okay. Um, uh, the important thing is that uh, uh, for relative rigid body motions, I'm a mathematician, I call that SE3, the special Euclidean group. Um, 
but it's sort of familiar, it's taught, I guess, in any un engineering um, undergraduate uh, syllabus. There's three translations and there's three rotations. So in this case, there's a pair of bases, there's a relative SE3 disp uh, uh, displacement between them. That's three components of translations. Uh, Boom, and there's three rotations. And then similarly, you can define an average, you get a base pair, da, 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 da. Okay, so now it's interesting. There's a bunch of different ways of doing this. Uh, we use something called curse plus coordinates uh, that was done by Lavery et al. I do that because my name is et al. I'm in that list somewhere. Um, but the, uh, the point is that there are so-called intras and inters we parameterize uh, rotations. It's always a interesting question, how you handle large computations on the rotation group. Uh, we use something called Cayley vectors. They're closely related to quaternions. Uh, I could talk endlessly about that, but I think that's not, this isn't the audience for that, like that. But now also the, the plus is you then also add phosphates. So now you have these bases and then there's a sugar, the sugar is still left implicit, but now you have a rigid uh, group of uh, uh, phosphates. And then you get an extra six degrees of freedom. Where does 42 come from? So you have a bunch of coordinates, actually you have a list of seven uh, SE rigid body displacement coordinates, they're all in dimension six, six times seven is 42. Um, it, Turns out, I mean, this is a coarse grain model. You have to throw away some detail. If you have double-stranded DNA, you have blunt DNA and you have non-blunt DNA. And the question is, it's whether you have the extra phosphate at the end. And so we have our end blocks. We, have, we do blunt DNA. We throw away one phosphate at an end. But I think for today, we don't care about that. Okay, good. So how do we get on? So the internal energy is approximated as a quadratic. So the equilibrium distribution, it's a very high dimensional Gaussian. I said we had this form before, which is maybe a Boltzmann form, but now we're gonna specialize and we're gonna say that we're going to try and predict uh, uh, a Gaussian model. So the free energy is gonna be quadratic. Now, is it the case that DNA uh, equilibrium distribution um, is Gaussian? Well, uh, the answer is it isn't. Uh, certain quantities uh, aren't, uh, not only aren't uh, exactly Gaussian, they can be uh, multi-weld, you can get multi-peak distributions. However, every single distribution um, that I've ever seen in DNA, I think anyone ever seen in DNA, has finite first and second moments. So you can actually cheat a little, you can say, okay, so the objective is to predict first and second moments as a function of sequence. And I know of no application in DNA where you need beyond second moments. And if you don't need to go beyond second moments, that's essentially saying all you care about is a Gaussian approximation like that. So for a Gaussian approximation, I need to know the ground state and I need to know the, the stiffness matrix like that. And this is the idea. So there's gonna be a formula. You give me a sequence and I'm gonna tell you how to estimate a parameter set and then for those two things, I will spit out for you a stiffness matrix that's positive definite uh, and a certain crowd. Right? And uh, then the input N is, is for an arbitrary uh, length of a sequence. The length of the sequence is little n and it's for an arbitrary uh, uh, sequence like that. Okay. So now, uh, sorry, I can't resist doing some mathematics. And so this in some sense is one of my favorite computations. So let me not sweat the detail, but I mean, I mean this computation you can actually do in gymnas in mathematics. And so uh, this guy over here is supposed to be a little quadratic form. X is gonna be a vector variable. And I'm saying I'm gonna have a quadratic energy in X, but X, the minimum needn't be at zero. So there's a shift little a in X and then a stiffness matrix A. So this is a quadratic energy in X and its minimum is at A and its stiffness is capital A. And then I'm gonna to add to it a little quadratic energy whose minimum is at B and stiffness is B. So then that's a quadratic function of X. 
So any quadratic function you can write as a single quadratic function with another coefficient matrix C and a shift little c, and there's a constant in general, right? So the crucial thing is what's the formula for capital C and little c in terms of capital A, capital B, little a, and little b? And you do the computation and the formula is this coefficient matrix C is the sum of those two coefficient matrices, but the shift is not related to the sum of the shifts. The shift C is C inverse times AA plus BB. And in particular, the naked A and the naked B never appear, right? And moreover, you have to invert this matrix to get the shift, okay? So let me not go through that, but I promise you, you can do that and that's the formula. And in particular, in a physics sense, it's the statement is in order to get an effective displacement, you don't average the displacements, you average sort of forces. So for us, this quadratic form is gonna be an energy. And so then the coefficient matrix times a displacement is like a force. So you average the forces, AA and BB, and then you multiply by C inverse to get an effective shift, okay? All right, so why do I mention that? So the point is, that's the computation that is central to CGDNA plus, and it's just magical. It just really works for the MD. Okay, so now how are we gonna do it? So now let me go more into the CGDNA uh, plus model. So here's going to be a junction. These are now going to be nucleotides. A is always going to go with T, da, 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 da. So now I'm going to, I'm going to assume that the energies add up. So here's my famous 42 uh, dimensional guy. That's the degrees of freedom for this junction. So I'm going to say there's an energy for this junction, and it looks like a 42 by 42 matrix. That matrix is going to depend upon X and Y. It's going to depend upon the composition of those base pairs, but no more. Right? And then I'm going to have these local shifts, which are going to be like my little A's and B's. But in point of fact, I'm then going to introduce the stiffness matrix times the shift like that. And so then in principle, you're going to expect that there's going to be 16 such blocks, the certain palindromic symmetries. It turns out only there's only 10 of them that are independent. You have to do some extra stuff at the end. So let's not worry about it. Right. OK, so the first statement now is. Each dinucleotide dependent parameter set is of this form. So then it's the stiffness matrices in the interior. It's the stiffness matrix at the end. Don't care about it. It's this shift vector that depends upon the dimer step. There's a shift vector at the end. Now, X and Y then depend upon the sequence. If it's unmodified, it's A, T, C, and G. If I'm allowing methylation, I extend the alphabet a little bit. And I'll talk about that a little bit, bit longer like that. How do we estimate these P's? So I told you that we I mean to get one parameter set, you have to run this big uh, molecular dynamics simulation, which might be take two or three weeks on a big machine in CITAS, something like that. But then what that then says is you pick a library of oligomers, right? And then we get estimates of first and second centered moments for each sequence SJ in the training library. So my sequence and the training library we actually use is there are 24 base pair uh, sequences. There's 16 of them. I then get first and second order statistics. I then call the Gaussian with those statistics row J. How do I estimate the parameter set? So now I do my construction of my model PDF. I stick it in the first slot of a kullback leibler divergence, and then I minimize over the parameter set. So that's, a, I mean, that's a, a, it's an optimization routine. It's in 20,000 dimensions, right? There's a lot of detail. It turns out that provided you precondition by the Fisher information matrix, for those of you who are into these sort of things, it's, you know, it's like that, you can do that parameter estimate. I mean, once you have the row J's, you get a parameter set in about an hour on a desktop, right? This is a quasi Newton method. Um, that sounds great. It took us about 10 years to get that to work. Uh, and for example, if you don't precondition on the Fisher information, it's 
months of computation to get it done. But now we've got it uh, very streamlined. Um, I don't know, there's a bit of a, um, sorry, I tend to make religious jokes don't mean to offend anybody, but there's Protestant and Catholic, okay? So which is better? So of course it's random, right? It's interesting, if anyone has any sort of religious statements to make, and now I've lost my mouse, where's my mouse gone? I mean, it's not entirely clear if you put the model in the first slot of kullback leibler divergence and the data in the second or vice versa. This is discussed in machine learning books. One machine learning book I said, we usually put the model in the second slot because it's easier numerically. I'm sort of more interested in fundamental scientific questions. If you do parameter estimation with a callback Leibler divergence like this, uh, which way around do you go? I'd be happy to talk to people about that anymore. Okay. If you don't know what callback Leibler divergence is, um, it's just a way of measuring differences between Gaussians, say like that. But now here's the reconstruction rule. So now the point is I need to build a banded stiffness matrix. And the statement is I have the first base, I mean, so I have the junction between base pair one and two, the junction between base pair two and three, exactly like that. So these parameter blocks just go in. And in order to build the big stiffness matrix, I showed you how to do it. You got C by adding A and B. So you generalize. What you do is you just take these blocks and you overlay them right, like that. And then the sigma vector is the AA and the BB. That says you build a dirty great big vector by overlaying parameter blocks. Right? And by this construction, the stiffness matrix K, that block three, four has only a local sequence dependence it's by construction. This block is of finite size by assumption, it's only 42 by 42. So it has a finite physical range and that's how you get it. Same thing with sigma, sigma has local sequence dependence, right? The ground state you get by taking the inverse of K times sigma, but K is a banded matrix. If you invert a banded matrix, it's dense. And in particularly the entries in the inverse matrix are non-local, have non-local sequence dependence. And the key statement is the ground state has a non-local dependence on sequence, right? This is the linear algebra expression of frustration. Basically one base pair needs to negotiate with its surrounding base pairs like that. And the statement now is it's stunningly good. <laughs> so now at that zoom, I can tell you that's a plot with each panel has three curves in it of a different curve, but it's actually not. That's a, they're double plots. And this is comparing an MD simulation with the model prediction, right? And you can basically can't see the difference. So you can like see a difference here, but then if you look at the scales, uh, um, I mean, this is like fractions of a degree. They're just tiny. It's just a stunningly good fit. And in particular, the error between the molecular dynamics simulation and the model is tiny compared to the variation with sequence. And that means you've got a really accurate model. Now, the other thing I should say is this, was, this is a comparison uh, between a model prediction and a molecular dynamics simulation where that sequence is not in the training set. And it, I mean, the, the quality of this approximation doesn't rely uh, on you only looking at oligomers in the training set, because otherwise you'd be pissing in the wind, basically. Um, this is another plot. This is a sequence. This is an alternating AT sequence. And then you do a SNP, a single nucleotide permutation from a T to an A. And then you get this really strong non-locality. So the parameter blocks only change locally, but the ground state, I mean, you only made a local change there and the change spreads out like that. And this is true both for the model and also when you check it against molecular dynamic simulations. So that's a big that's a big check. So what I want to, I mean, I will go to the wall arguing that CGDNA plus is incredibly accurate compared to any underlying MD simulation. However, MD simulations themselves are just a model, right? Now, it'd be much better to have a quantitative direct check against experiment, right? That's very difficult. But there's reasons to be optimistic 
because there's a third big data set, which is the PDP. So the PDP is the protein data bank. It's mainly for protein, for Chris X-ray crystal structures of proteins, folded proteins, but there's also a number of protein double-stranded DNA co-crystals. So you can look at statistics for shapes of uh, DNA uh, coming from these co-crystals, and then you can try and do the same statistics coming from, uh, uh, the, uh, from the coarse grain model. Now, there's another thing I now need to say is that we talked about the ATCG alphabet. It turns out A and G have two, two rigid rings and they're called purines, they're big. Uh, C and T only have one rigid ring and they're relatively small, right? And the statement is that it seems that the thing that completely dominates uh, the statistical mechanics is uh, YR, purine pyrimidine alphabet, right? Like that. And so now, then I'll show you this. So now hopefully if there's big data people, so these are two dendrograms and on the top, this is a dendrogram drawn uh, from uh, this PDP X-ray data. And that really is experiment. And you can sort of see the clustering and the statement. So here's an AT cluster in black. So in the MD, you also get an AT cluster. It happens to be over here. I mean, there's an interesting question. When are two dendrograms the same? But the point is that the, the two data sets, they basically cluster. These are for tetramers. They cluster to the middle dimer step so you see that uh, except for YR steps. So for YR steps, it turns out there's three independent ones, there's TA, CG, and CA. And then these guys, uh, basically, these are a long way from all the rest, and it's not so easy to distinguish them. And that's also the same now uh, down here. So there's lots of similarities. So that's the first reason, uh, if you like, to hope that uh, the MD simulation isn't, oh, that was bad. Uh, uh, you can still see my slides. Can you give me a thumb up, Jan? Okay, thank you. Right, uh, where am I? Oh, I skipped some slides too, there we go. Right, so that's the model. <clears throat> Shall we say a rapid overview? But now, now what I really want to do is, I now want to start scanning things, right? And I want to make the link to bioinformatics. So a single chromosome, a single covalently bonded DNA molecule is typically of length 10 to the fifth, 10 to the eighth base pairs. That's way beyond, you'd never see that as a naked piece of DNA. That's way beyond the length scale, whether it's either feasible or sensible to compute a cgDNA plus PDF, right? So instead, we aim to compute this local model of marginal PDFs for short subsequences like that. So you're gonna say, I don't want a model for an entire chromosome. I want a model for a window inside the chromosome. And then I'm gonna slide that window. This is sort of a standard picture stolen from somewhere like that. But now, because of the shape non-locality, that's a little bit difficult because this window there's always going to be edges, and the edges depend upon the bit just beyond the window. How do you do that? You have to start worrying about averages and da 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 da, like that. And in point of fact, those dendrograms I showed you, they were four base pair windows. They already involved uh, averaging. So then, what you have to do is you have to figure out how to average Gaussians. So now this must be a standard textbook thing. And I'd be very help, very grateful if somebody would email me and say, it's in this textbook. Um, Cause there's a few wrinkles, which I haven't, I, mean, I can't believe this is original, but I haven't actually really seen it written down. So what, what's an average Gaussian? Well, it turns out averaging the ground states isn't so bad. I mean, if you have M cases, the sensible average ground state is you just take the Euclidean average. What else would you do? The interesting thing is then, if you want an average stiffness matrix, or this is an average covariance, an inverse average stiffness matrix, you average the inverse of each of the um, uh, individual stiffness matrices, but then you need to make a correction to center things. And the formula is that the inverse, the, the average covariance 
should be the inverse of the harmonic average, namely it's one over the stiffnesses, and then it's plus this guy, and that sigma mu, that's a shape covariance matrix. Right? That's somehow the idea. Right. Now here's a remarkable thing, is that's a formula that applies to any ensembles of Gaussians. This, this term here only depends upon the ground states. This term only depends upon the stiffnesses. For Gaussians, those are independent things. For all the CGDNA plus models we've seen, the eigenvectors of that matrix and that matrix are incredibly close. And that's saying something about the physics. So the biggest variation in the, in the shape with sequence is in the softest modes of the stiffness matrix. And it's physically plausible, uh, but uh, it's a, I mean, well, it's a fact and it's an interesting thing. Okay, so I have completely blown the timing of this talk. And so um, I'm now gonna do the bad thing and flip through a bunch of things and then show you some cool data. I'm gonna show you some data where you methylate that's the atomic detail of a cytosine, a C. Methylation means you remove a hydrogen and you replace it by a carbon and three hydrogens. You replace a hydrogen by a methyl group like that. That's a, so this is changing three atoms in 47 or something like that. It's a relatively small change, you might think, right? Hydroxymethylation, we aren't gonna talk about. The other thing you need to understand to understand the data I'm gonna show you is something called sequence logos. So sequence logos are a standard tool in bioinformatics. They're to tell you information about how much a sequence varies. So there's something called CTCF. It's a certain transcription factor binding protein. It has a 19 base pair uh, binding site, uh, but it's not a unique, it doesn't bind to a unique sequence. And there's 930 known Bind different binding sites. So what you can do is you can then basically plot the probability, say at base pair 10 of the 19, that there's a G. And then this is shown, that's a dirty great big G. So essentially it's probability one that you'll have a G there. It's probability nearly one that you'll have a C there. You have a changing amplitude because traditionally what you do is you weight it by actually Shannon entropy as information content. Right. So sequence logos tell you the likelihood that one of the four bases are likely to be at a certain location. It's just a way of coding information. Okay. Right. So now I have this big ensemble of Gaussians. What do I do? So uh, the first thing I, I would like to say is what do they cluster? Well, so I've already shown you a dendogram. Right? Can I cluster? But the dendogram, it turns out, was on shapes. You don't have any information about stiffnesses from crystal structure. Does the, do, the, do the Gaussians also cluster in shape and stiffness? So um, we've done it for clustering K-mers, where K is, uh, uh, actually, it's, uh, that's a typo. It's from four through nine, all right? See, nine is already up at 100, it's 500,000 cases, something like that. It starts to get non-trivial. Uh, four, there's a 256 cases. Right? I'm going to show you data for the, the case four. We're going to do PCA, principal component analysis, on the shape matrix. It's interesting. Standard PCA does not work. What does work is a generalized PCA where you project onto eigenvalues. This is the shape covariance, and then you put a, it's a generalized eigenvalue problem. You put this in this harmonic mean covariance matrix on the right-hand side. The stuff about this, use single linkage algorithm to identify clusters, uh, has a bunch of nice properties. The point is you always get a gap. So this is for formers. You get four principal eigenvalues, one, two, three, four, then you get a gap and you get a bunch of rest. If you do a five mer, you get five and a gap and mess. A six more, you get six and a gap. Oh, now, of course, what's, when is a gap a gap? A bit subjective, but I mean, that's a big gap. And it seems that the rule is K. If you doubt, this is standard PCA. These are colors. Uh, these are color coded. It's just a mess, right? If you do uh, this 
metric PCA, this weighted PCA, um, and now you, I mean, this is for the PCA is at dimension four. I can't draw in four, I can draw in three. You start to see these colors and you start to see a, a, a clustering. Now what I can do is I can, uh, I can do the, uh, the hierarchical single linkage clustering. I get two to the K clusters, and then I can do a sequence logo in each cluster, okay? You have four base pairs in purine pyrimidine alphabet you get two to the four, that's 16 clusters. And you exactly get these 16 clusters, right? And it's exactly in the, right? And it's, it's purine pyrimidine alpha, alphabet, right? So this cluster, uh, you must have a pyrimidine, a pyrimidine, a purine, and a purine. It's quite curious, this is weighted by information content. This cluster, it doesn't seem to matter. You go, right, but you're getting, Right, you start to do this stuff, right? Um, fine, so that's clustering. It'd still also be nice to make a connection to real genomes. And that's now what I want to do. So now I'm gonna do take a, uh, a window and start running it along a genome. So now human genomes are a bit big. One of the standard biological tests is to use yeast. So, um, uh, actually, let me just, I'm just going to show you the results. Uh, there we go. So this is um, Baker's yeast. It's also Brewer's yeast. I prefer the name Brewer's yeast. Um, it has, this is chromosome one of Brewer's yeast. And what I've done is I'm computing this kullback leibler divergence of the 10 base pair window from average DNA. And the average DNA is this average of Gaussians, which I talked about. So this looks as though it's a stochastic time series, but it isn't. This is a stochastic location series. So there's a 10 base pair window, I move it by one, I move it by another one, right? And this is plots of this kullback leibler divergence. And then this is like 2.2 times 10 to the fifth um, different locations. So then this is a histogram now of the values along that location series. But now what I can do is say, okay, so these are the exceptionally high guys, right? So I mark those with red, and now I can do um, a sequence logo. What are the high outliers? And here's the outliers. They're just pure A's and T's. So it's an AT sequence is the sequence that's furthest from average, like that. And so that's, these are all the, you could do low outliers, you get CGs, but it's less clear. This is for a 10 base pair window. Why did I pick 10? Well, DNA is 10 and a half base pairs per turn. If you do 11, well, so one is, sorry, uh, 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 Baker's yeast has eight chromosomes. It's true for all the chromosomes. It's true for 11 base pair sites. It's true for 20 base pair sites. Yeast has nucleosomes. Nucleosomes have 147 base pair uh, sequences. If you do 147 base pair, you similarly get the outliers are all A's and T's. It's because it's red and green. Actually, if I now zoom into that a little bit, you know, there's a little bit of C and T, the yellows here, but you get this incredible signal that the mechanical outliers are very rich in A and T. So we started a little bit late, and I'm also um, going to uh, um, uh, run a little bit long and have fewer questions because I want actually I want to show you these slides. Okay, so now you can ask what happens if I methylate. So what I can do is every time there's a CPG step, I can methylate the the C, right? I do the same thing. I, I then measure the distance of that marginal PDF from an average PDF. And I, and I get this again, I get this stochastic series. But then when I bin all the values, this is no longer uh, unimodal. You can see that there are these three peaks, right? So now I can't talk about standard deviations, but I can talk about percentiles. So one statement is it blew by rather fast. But the, 
the exceptional ones were 0.3 before, and now they're 0.47. So these exceptional sequences after methylating are much, much further from the mean than without being methylated. So now I want to do uh, sequence logos for these guys. And lo and behold, well, uh, so if I'm not going to do the sequence logo, what I'm going to show is what's these multiple peaks. So that multiple peak, it's a peak of sequences with one methylated C, two methylated Cs, and three methylated Cs. And it turns out that for 10 base pairs, threes, actually, there's a, you can get four. There's a little peak in there. So basically, every time you methylate a C in a CPG step, you move the mechanical properties far away from average like that. And, and in particular, the, if you like, the outlying sequence switches from being AAAT rich to being methylated CPG rich. Uh, I'm running out of time, but I still can't uh, uh, avoid this joke. This is a sequence logo is by color because it's a sequence logo for dimer steps instead of base pairs. It's again, a fairly standard thing to say, but blue and yellow, of course, is the Ukrainian flag. And as probably many of you know, England beat the Ukraine, I guess yesterday in Euro 2021. And that makes me very, very sad because I'm Scottish. But anyway, there you go. Uh, application three, we will blow away because we aren't going to get there. Uh, right. Coarse grain model really accurately predicts coarse grain distribution compared to MD, right? You need a big data set to do that. Once you've done that big simulation, then the cgDNA plus model, you can scan millions of long sequences, right? MD very probably is very accurate when the counter islands are monovalent. All bets are off if you have divalent, trivalent, and other ions. And alas, magnesium in particular is probably very important in biology. So this coarse grain model should be careful about those phenomena. All right? This CGDNA lock makes you allows you to make this link. Uh, you can start to see K dominant modes in a window like that. You get this stuff about outliers uh, uh, in a standard sequence alphabet, the exceptional sequences are AT rich. If you allow epigenetic modifications, it's CPG steps that completely dominate. And in some sense in biology, there's things called CPG islands, which is where you get most Cs. And it's really known that whether or not they're methylated really changes the, uh, uh, the regulation. This application I didn't talk about. There's still lots to do. Thank you very much for all of your attention. Thank you very much, John, for your talk. Sorry, I went Are a little there... long. No problem, no problem. Are there any questions in the audience? I've seen, Emmanuel, you had a question at the very beginning. Okay, then please let me say some words of closing for this seminar. Thank you so much, John. It was a very interesting talk. Thank you. I'd like to thank also our colleagues who dialed in and, uh, and followed and, and asked questions. Uh, we have some events already lined up for when we are back after summer and the semester starts again. So the 27th of September, we are welcoming Professor Marcel Salati. He will be followed in October by Pavan Ramidia and then in November by Simon Malamud. Uh, you can have a look at the website of CS and you will see that we have fantastic talks lined up for the next nine to 10 months. Nevertheless, if you would like to speak and it's no problem for you that the first slots we can offer you to speak is in May, please drop me an email and I'm happy to find a date for you to speak yourself at one of our next CIS Get to Know Your Neighbors seminars. Um, I wish you all a great day, a great summer, and we are looking forward to seeing you all back after the summer break. Stay safe. Goodbye. Thank you very much again. Thank you, John.